Well, hello there, you're watching the press preview. A first look at what is on the front pages. Time then to see what's making the headlines with the Daily Mirror's associate editor, Kevin McGuire, and the Daily Mail's Whitehall editor, Claire Ellicott. Welcome to both of you. Yeah. So, as ever, let's check out the front pages then, shall we? Starting with The Guardian, which reports on President Joe Biden calling the US commitment to defending Israel ironclad amid fears of an imminent attack by Iran. The Telegraph leads with Biden's stern warning to Iran not to launch an attack against Israel. The Metro highlights the tragic death of a young woman who was reportedly inhaling two or three bottles of laughing gas a day. The Times reports that every constituency in Britain had a rise in sickness benefit claims last year, especially in conservative areas. Meanwhile, the Express's headline, Radical NHS Plan to Fast-Track Care and Free Up Beds. The Daily Mail reports that thousands of fake stamps are entering Britain from China, leaving victims with £5 fines. The Financial Times reports a dip in market confidence regarding US interest rate cuts as higher inflation exceeds expectations. And the Star claims that one in seven Brits are reusing old tea bags to save money. A reminder, by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. So let's go to Kevin McGuire and Claire Ellicott, who are here. Um, coverage about this imminent Iranian threat, President Biden's ironclad support for Israel, having overnight said they're making a mistake. Kevin? Yeah, well, if you're given ironclad support, you can say they made a mistake. Are they going to change? I mean, that's it. And the US is the biggest arms supplier... Uh, to Israel, actually also to Egypt as well, which has a border which it has shut with, Ga uh, shut with Gaza. But, yeah, this is the... It says intelligence sources are saying there is an imminent attack in retaliation for Israel attacking a diplomatic mission of Iran in Damascus in Syria because the Israelis have been assassinating people in Syria and also in Lebanon. And that risks spreading the war and... <laughs> gets out of hand, the US will be dragged in. Does Israel then strike back at Iran itself? Uh, yeah, this is, this is a conflagration that uh, will affect the whole world, both p politically, militarily and economically. Mm. And uh, the Financial Times, uh, with a, a picture there on its front page, a shattered spirits, sombre reflection takes place of festivities as Gaza marks the start of Eid, the end of the month-long fast of Ramadan. You know, the difficulties, the picture there of people trying to, to mark this festival in, in, in rubble and ruin, Claire. Yeah, so this should be a time of celebration and the Muslim festival of Ramadan. You fast for a month and families are meant to come together at Eid. It's a great celebration throughout the Islamic world. And um, you would normally see people coming together and eating food and celebrating their families coming from far and wide to celebrate with them. And the events in Gaza have obviously overshadowed the celebration this year. You've got, you know, you can see them these beautiful bright prayer mats and in the background the rubble the destroyed you know infrastructure around them it's a different Eid this year and um, for everyone in Gaza and everybody who is also Muslim and is in solidarity with them it, it's it's just a very muted celebration this year it's not the same as uh, I live in a bit of East London with a high Bengali population it was incredible watching families out all dressed up in their yeah. you know their finest clothes as you say going out to eat there's a fun fair you know, it was a, it was, Almost like a carnival, yeah. Christmas Day, uh, but it's the it's the indomitable human spirit. When you look at this, that that is in a smashed mosque. You can see in the picture the uh, minarets you know, mm -hmm. have, have been toppled, and yet there there are people um, praying the way you know, Christians would, might go to church and sing carols. They're, they're praying. They, I don't know how they've kept their prayer mats <laughs> in in that condition. They presumably highly prized, valued and, uh, mm. and, and hidden away. But what's happening in, in Gaza is absolutely horrific. And go back to, you know, what triggered it on October the 7th in a long conflict, but triggered it with that horrific uh, pogrom by Hamas, uh, 1,200 Israelis killed, more than 250 uh, hostages taken. But 
it's equally, if not more so now, horrific what the Israelis have done in Gaza with more than 33,000 people killed, the vast majority of women and children. Yeah, killed, brutalised, tortured, you might say, for yeah. uh, the Israeli suffering on October Yeah, no, 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 revenge. Yeah, yeah. And, and yet on mm. this day, uh, on Eid, um, the relatives mm. of the political leader of Hamas, Ishmael Haniya, were said to be heading to a refugee camp to see their relatives. Three of his sons killed. Let's just watch the moment when he found out. Yes, finding out that three of his sons had been, you know, martyred was, was his reaction to that and his grandchildren as well. He critical to ceasefire discussions which have been taking place in Qatar. He's based in Qatar. And whether this will make a difference or, mm -hmm. you know, that Israel said that, that they attacked terrorist operatives heading towards the central Gaza Strip. But, you know, Claire, this is, this is a delicate time, obviously, isn't it? Of course. And I think the really striking thing about, about that video that was just shown is he doesn't react at all and, you know, he's just, ha he's just learned that three of his sons have died, his grandchildren have died and there's just absolutely no reaction and it's, um, I think he, it's, it's a really key time because they're still trying to negotiate the release of hostages, to negotiate some sort of ceasefire and he is the key, the key negotiator in this and he's almost sending a message to Israel that even though he's lost key members of his family, that he's not going, that's not going to change how he reacts to it. Yes. People, people, people respond to grief differently, but that is in, he's either incredibly composed, internally he's dying, or he's just so focused on, on what, he, what he does and is absolutely driven by that. Killing children is, is wrong, whether it was Hamas and Israelis or Israeli and Palestinians. And uh, his, his children may be adults, but his grandchildren aren't. Mm going to be. And we saw what happened with the aid workers. As Israel says, mil terrorists, militants, whatever you want to call them, are there. And that's justification for killing people. Well, it's not. Mm. It just isn't. Well, certainly Israeli commentators said that the three sons, unknown Hamas operatives in Israel, have said they were terrorists. But uh, in terms of um, uh, Ishmael Haniya, uh, The Guardian reported earlier that 60 of his relatives had been killed in the six-month-old war, including 14 who died after an Israeli airstrike hit the family home uh, back in uh, October. And clearly, hitting the leadership of Hamas is absolutely central to the aims mm -hmm of um, Israel's war on Gaza, which, as far as they're concerned, continues with a date, we're told, for, uh, for Rafa. Well, can you imagine the condemnation that would be deserved if uh, Hamas somehow killed the children and grandchildren of a cabinet minister mm. in, in Israel? It'd be absolutely wrong, but this is just as wrong. Mm. Let's go to the Times, Claire, shall we? Um, every constituency in Britain, the paper tells us, had a rise in sickness benefit claims last year, with some of the biggest being recorded in conservative areas. What's the significance yes. of this? It's really interesting because um, the pattern of, of, of long-term sickness in the UK it has always been that people suffer from mus musculoskeletal diseases and, you know, they've, they're bad backs from being hunched over a computer from doing manual work. And it's now started to shift to mental health problems in the wake of the pandemic. And um, people have been suffering from long COVID, lots of people suffering to, from depression and anxiety. And this has really been a marked increase in this. And um, this, this story is actually really interesting because... It's showing that in Tory areas, which traditionally are more leafy, they're more middle class and mm. um, Labour tend to dominate big towns where you have a, a, a different spread of people, um, that, that the sickness claims are going up. So people are claiming benefits because they can't work because they're long term sick. And they're actually attributing this to um, mental health. And they're saying that it's been cited in 69% of cases, um, according to official figures. So it is really interesting. And I think in the wake of the pandemic, it has been a real theme. But, but also mental health services, we know, are part of the difficult squeeze on the NHS. They and, are. and as we know, waiting lists for those mm -hmm. who are not mental health and are waiting for treatment, they may not be getting the treatment they need. No, no, absolutely. Uh, I'm sure that's probably happening in Tombridge, Basingstoke, South Cambridge and Buckingham, which are for the areas where proportionately, you know, the traditionally Tory areas, where the proportionate increase is bigger than elsewhere. But politically, Bashing benefit claimants, welfare scroungers, has been a tour or the theme of and a tune sung by some Tories. Now, can they do that anymore when it is their voters mm -hmm. who are actually now claiming benefits and uh, 
fueling the increase? I suspect they can't, because of course the IMF is saying benefits should be cut. OK. Let's plenty see if they're going to do it. Apparently yeah. not. <laughs> yeah, well, plenty more in the next part of our programme as well. Uh, more from the front pages, including this in The Times 2. It's headline, Gender Clinics in Ministers' Sites After Refusing to Share Their Data. Um, a continuing fascinating story. Back with that in just a moment. Welcome back. You are watching the press preview, Claire. Uh, with me now, Kevin McCoy and Claire Ellicott. She's trying to read a story. It's not fair to tell her off, is it, really? But anyway. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's like a SWAT. <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't She's say trying like... to read the papers. Yeah, goodness, well, I won't take a Boris Johnson line and call you a girly <laughs> SWAT. I'll just call you a SWAT. <laughs> uh, right, let's go to the Times. Uh, gender clinics in minister sites after refusing to share data. This was a considerable number of them, wasn't it, Claire? Yes, six out of seven, according to this report. And, um, and the, the health secretary, um, Victoria Adkins, has now spoken to the head of the NHS to talk about overhauling some of these services because they've refused to, re to supply the data that they needed to talk for... for for a review. And Henry Cass has obviously um, done this really quite groundbreaking report into gender, um, gender services offered in the UK. And um, they're now going to be looking at um, adult services. And there's just been huge concern about all of this. Is that this is one of the first times, you know, anywhere in the world they've had really a landmark review into what this all means for some of the people who've gone through the services. And to say that a number of NHS clinics haven't supplied the data that is needed, with all the controversy around the Tavistock Clinic, which has had to close, yeah. um, it, it's, it's a really compelling case. It's appalling, women. actually. If, yeah. if six out of seven NHS adult gender clinics thwarted, as Hilary Cass says, her... Her investigation, not cooperating with the University of York, which is very good on health economics, uh, that was doing the investigation. The tele and the telegraphs say the um, yeah the uh, Tavistock Clinic yeah. uh, won't uh, won't uh, give what happened to nine thousand uh, trans children. Well, this is in the telegraph. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. I so, mean, so nine thousand went the through Tavistock. The facts, to, well, to, the facts to find the evidence mm -hmm. to find out what really happened. And it's where I think Cass scores. She seems four years, seems to have looked at it very uh, thoroughly mm. and with this degree of objectivity, while in this argument, which is, she admitted it, is so polarised and toxic at times, you have, like, two sides, almost like in a First World War battle, just firing shells at, uh, at, at each other and demonising each other, uh, and it's kind of pretty, pretty horrific. Yeah, that and people way. receiving NHS treatment without people feeling that they could ask the questions about whether or not it was appropriate. Yeah, yeah. But on the flip side of that, there's five thousand people still waiting to be seen, still on waiting list to get treatment yeah. in this sort of period of, of, you know, trying to work out what treatment they're going to get, aren't they? And this review of adult services now, which the Times talks about, adult NHS gender services face being overhauled amid mounting anger from ministers over their completely unacceptable refusal to participate in this research. You know, we, we await more on this, I think, probably, don't we? Um, let's go to the front page of the Daily Mail. Claire, your paper. Uh, thousands of fake stamps... Sorry. Is this postal stamps? Yes. ..are entering Britain from China? Yes, so it's an so extraordinary story. Apparently, there's all these um, fake stamps being brought in from China. They're being... I think Royal Mail have contracts with big companies to sell them blocks of, you know, um, stamps. But for smaller companies, they don't have to buy through the Royal Mail. And some of these are apparently all fake. And people are being having to pay £5 penalties to collect their posts. It's quite extraordinary. And um, I think um, some... Experts have called it economic warfare, which is quite it's extraordinary, a... but it is. <laughs> but it's not, I mean, you know, in a way, it's, it's not it's China, though. It's not the Chinese government, it's people in China, just as you know, we get, you just get scam calls from all over the place. It's not, it's not Fu Manchu you know, doing this, is it? You know, sort of bringing up demons all the time. Uh, it's got to be tackled, but I suppose the way you investigate it is somebody's bought some stamps from a shop and they've put them on a letter, it's gone, and then whoever they sent it to has to pay a fiver. They take yeah. it back to the shop. Where did you get your stamps from? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can only buy them from the post office, I imagine. Very interesting. Despite all its uh, terrible behaviour to <laughs> Mr Bates and the others, it's... Separate uh... story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, quick look at The Guardian. Uh, very much the end of the amateur era, it feels, does it not? If you're going to get 
uh, prize money in athletics for winning a gold medal at the uh, Paris Olympics. This feels a bit overdue, doesn't it? Um, they've changed the rules so that athletes <laughs> who win gold medals will get $50,000. And um, in my view, great, these people deserve money. And also, you know, for years we've been hearing about um, sports like heptathlons and javelin and things like that. They're not really rewarded in... Um, they're not really rewarded properly yeah, in schools. and a fortune. After you've won, but they're not. Yeah. You're not going to run. Premier, you're not going to. You're not going to run faster. I think. Oh, I really want to win the hundred <laughs> meters now. Got to go to the weather. Got to go to the weather. <laughs> uh, more from both of you later, Claire and Kevin. Thank, thank you very much indeed.